The uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, yesterday, we were using yesterday's date for the Wi-Fi password, and that is still working right now, but that is going to be changing over the course of the day. And the new password will not be being posted up on the walls. The password is going to be Dornalis with a capital D. And the, the reason why we're changing it and not posting it is that there is an extremely large song, software conference going on next door that apparently has very poor Wi-Fi and they were piggybacking on us yesterday. <laughs> Dornalis. Dornalis, as in the major room, the D-O-R, please correct me if I'm wrong, D-O-R-N-E-L-E-S. The patron, patron saint of the Brazilian Python community. So since the password will not be posted, do feel free to tell people during the day. There may be places where the old password works instead of the new while the transition is taking place. But if, if people with the badges from the other conference ask you for the password, you can laugh at them. Are the audiovisual people ready? Hola, I'm Steve McMahon, and today, today's talk is on Diazo. I'm going to be talking about how, giving you some idea of how Diazo works in the background. There are a few things that you should know, and if you know those things, it will help you get a good model of, in your mind of how Diazo works. Uh, if you have the right mental model when you were writing Diazo rules, you'll understand why some of the rules you tried to use in the past failed. It, it'll, it'll help you have fewer mysterious problems with Diazo. This talk has been rated technical for disturbing thematic elements like references to XSL, but it won't be too technical. In particular, we are not going to be doing any XSL today. So you, you will not be seeing mysterious XSL commands. Instead, though, I'm going to be showing you some pseudocode for XSL when we get to that. You're, you're going to miss the XSL. Ah. Feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, if you need to ask questions, I, I will usually be able to handle that. What you will need to know something about today in order to understand the talk is HTML, XML, and CSS. Let's do a quick review of, of how di the basics of Diazo so that we can all get on the same page and understand the words we're using. In, with Diazo, we start with a theme. And a theme is a presentation, typically mock-up, a page that's been prepared in HTML that shows what our page should look like. And it may have boilerplate, it may have meaningless text in it, or photographs that are going to be replaced. And they're going to be replaced with content that is coming from a content management system or just about anything else in the world that can be grabbed. The rules tie those together. Diazo <clears throat> takes those three elements, the theme, the rules, and the content, and it uses the, rule, the rules to produce themed content at the end. So you've taken a theme page, which is a presentation, a page that may have been, say, created by a designer. That's our theme. You've taken content that's being produced by Plone or by Django or just about by anything else, and then you use a set of rules that are written in XSL. You run it through the Diazo engine, and that produces themed content at the end. By the way, Diazo is named after a printing process that uh, is used for blueprints, for making blueprints, and it is pronounced Diazo. 
I've spoken of content of it as if it was singular. In fact, the Diazo engine can combine content from several sources into one themed page when it produces it. There doesn't just have to be one set of content. You could conceivably be fetching content from several places inside a Plone site, or you could be combining a Plone site with elements that are drawn from somewhere else. You could have a pyramid engine doing database constructs and preparing a portion of your page, and you could be combining that with Plone content using Diazo. You can also have multiple theme files. Theme files can be connected together. They're include files, and you can use conditions to tie them together uh, using different themes, say, for different portions of a website. And all of that is a planned part of the Diazo theming engine. Okay, let's take a look at how that combining of a theme and content works. Here is our HTML, the HTML page that we are starting out with. Now this is actually Plone.org, the site, but let's say that this had been prepared by a designer. We're looking at the basic page here, and then we're looking at the rules, or the HTML, sorry, that is used to construct that page in brief. Now, if we have been handed this by a designer, and this is not real content, we're going to be connecting real content from the content management system with places, with spots that we identify inside this page. And so what we are typically doing is we are identifying, say, the news column, and we identify its selector. We look at the CSS, or we look over at the HTML, and we look for a CSS selector that allows us to uniquely identify that. We can also use XPath to uniquely identify content, but CSS is much easier for most of us, and there's no particular reason not to use CSS to identify them. So let me show you. We can be picking out a few other spots here. Uh, I've picked out uh, the upcoming events, and we found that inside the HTML, and we found a selector to work with it, uh, a, the get clone, the right column, the doormat of the page, all identified, and we've identified the selectors for them. So here is the content side. So a moment ago, we were looking at what is our theme, a structured presentation set up by a designer that has places into which we're going to put the content. Now, this is what a Plone page looks like. And in that Plone page, we're going to be identifying things like the portlet that contains news because we want to take that news portlet, however it might be presented on the Plone page, and we're going to be gluing it into a spot in our final presentation. So we need to identify it, and then we write rules to tie these things together. So again, we've identified portions of the theme HTML, we've identified portions of the content HTML, and now this is all basically just XML boilerplate. And then we reach our real rule, which is in one spot, which tells us that we're going to replace the children of Newsbox, Newsbox was from our theme, with a portion of the content that is the portal news. So there's the specific rule. Uh, we have just plain XML uh, boilerplate up here declaring the namespaces we need. We have an, a surrounding rule which basically tells our, in our rule set, don't bother theming anything that is not Plone content. So we're skipping everything that doesn't have a visual portal wrapper ID. Okay, how does Plone, or how does Diazo work to do this? Now, when I started working with Diazo, I had what I now call a naive metal model of how that, is, that work is done. Let me show you what, in my, what I thought was going on. I thought that we started with the theme and we started with the content, and then we would have a Diazo rule, our first Diazo rule, and that it would be put through the Diazo engine to produce a version of the theme. And then we would move the theme up and apply a second rule, producing a new version of the theme. So in my mind, Diazo, the Diazo engine worked like a procedural language one step at a time. And that there was something it was working on called, that I called in my mind the themed content. 
that was continually getting changed and put through the engine. Step on again. The, con the, the version of Theme 2 that was produced by Diazo Rule 2 becomes the grist for our mill. It becomes what's going to be worked on by Diazo. We execute yet another rule, and we get yet another version of the theme. So again, that's what I call the naive mental model. <coughs> Sorry. That naive model, though, breaks down. I mean, you can't really hold that model together any longer when you start doing things like content drops and replaces. A content drop is when you're not trying to put a piece of content into the theme page, you're trying to make it disappear. You're trying to make it not appear. So you're grabbing some big portion of news, but you're omitting an item. That's a content drop. So let's see how we might try and think about that in our model. We have theme, and we have content, and we have a diazo content rule, like one that does a drop or a replace. Well, in my mind, I had this picture where diazo was sort of cooking the content to produce cooked content, and that went up, and it somehow became a portion of the inputs that we would f attack with the rest of our diazo rules, but what would we be producing at the, at the end? And the problem with thinking this way is I wasn't getting the right results. I was trying to think procedurally with Diazo as if it was a programming language, the Diazo rules, and as a result I was getting into all sorts of mysteries about how things like content drop rules worked and how they, enter, how they mixed in with the other rules. Have other folks run into that sort of mystery? Or was I alone and naive? Okay. Let's move on and try and get, get now a better mental model of how Diazo works. And this mental model is, is based on looking at how the Diazo engine actually does things, uh, though I'm simplifying it. Okay, here we're going to break the processing into two parts, because Diazo actually works in two parts, not one. In part one of the process, only the theme and rules are visible. The content is not visible during the first part of the processing at all. Diazo processes the theme and the rules, and it produces an XSL template, an extensible style sheet language template. That template, if you look at it, will actually contain a four, fair portion of the content mixed in with XSL rules, with XSL transformation rules. So, in reality, Diazo takes the theme and the rules, it is not looking at the content at all in the first step, and it produces an XSL template. Then, that XSL template is combined with the content and it is put through the XSL transformation engine to produce the output page. Yes? Does this the XSL template, uh, is it accessible for, for us to... It can be. If you are using Plone app theming, this process is hidden from you. The, the two seem combined in one step, but in fact it is two separate steps. Uh, but you, you do not have to use Plone app theming. You can use the Diazo engine outside of it. And you can use the transformation engines from a variety of sources to do that. So you can see I was anticipating your question exactly. Plone app theming is one of the transformation engines that you can use. Plone app theming applies the Diazo rules to produce the XSL template and then it passes it, through the, passes it through the XSLT transform with the content to get the output page. But you can instead use Diazo to generate your XSLT template and then to work with Apache or Nginx or Varnish or WSGI, any, any pipeline, any reverse proxy that has the ability to do XSL transformations. And this is one of the ways in which you can use Diazo to combine content from a variety of sources. In fact, you, don't, you can use Diazo without Plone at all. There is nothing that is absolutely Plone specific about Diazo. It is simply that Plone has embraced Diazo and made it much easier to use. 
I mean, we, it's the heart of our theming strategy now. So what should you be getting out of that, what, out of what I've just said? You should be getting that there are two parts to the processing. In the first part, the theme is visible and the rules. Those are combined to make an XSL template. In the second part of the process, the XSL template and the content are visible and are being processed by the XSL transformation engine. During the first part of the process, the content is not visible. XSL rules will be written that apply to it, but it is not visible. You cannot make any decision on the basis of what is in the content. In the second part of the process, the theme is no longer visible. The original rule set is no longer visible. All that is visible at that point in the processing is the template and the content. By the way, Paul, please correct me if I'm saying anything wrong. <laughs> Paul Everett is one of the people who originally worked on all of this. So please correct me. <laughs> I'll, we're we're going we're gonna to blame everything on Ian. That is Ian Bicking. Okay, so part, again, looking back to part one, we, we now know that the content isn't really visible. Now, how is it that Diazo will actually take the theme and the rules to produce this template? The important thing for you to know is that the way it works is more like CSS than it is like Python. Python is a procedural language. It follows one step at a time. Learning Diazo for me initially was hard because I am a Python programmer by orientation, and I have to switch gears when I do CSS. I have to think differently. But it, when we're thinking in Python, we're basically thinking in steps, procedures that do transformations. CSS is instead rules, and those rules apply on the basis of specificity the specificity of the rules. Then in part two, where we've got the XSL template and the content, and we're using that XSL transformation engine, that XSL transformation engine is a very, very strange beast. It's essentially a recursive node processor that should mean nearly nothing to you right now. Um, unless you had a computer science background, and even then it may seem confusing. But basically, it's going to process stuff, and then it continues processing. It reprocesses what it's processed until it has uh, basically run through all of the applicable rules. You have a little bit of control over the, how that process works if you're writing SSL, but because you can pick the points at which the recursion stops. But basically, you're processing material, and then you're processing it again until you run out of rules. Okay, let's, let's look at how, let, let's, in code, watch the steps that we're taking. So I'm going to do a simple replace operation in Diazo. Here is how we might write a replace rule. This is going to replace a portion of a theme page with content that we're picking up from our content management system. So this rule says, uh, grab the portion of the theme that has the CSS uh, selector on it, theme one, and replace it with the content, uh, with the portion of the content page that has content one, uh, the content one ID on it. And let's see. Okay. that. Is that is going to be turned into a, basically an XSL template. Now, I promised you no XSL, and some were disappointed. Uh, and this is how I'm going to show you things that are happening with XSL just as pseudocode. A replace, uh, re replace rule has been transformed into actually, in this case, basically one XSL instruction, which is grab content one and stick it here. Then let's go through step two. Step two. In step two, the content has actually become available, and our, our original page has now been transformed because sitting at this point is whatever came over from the content management system or from our database. It's, it's the content stuff pulled in by the XSL transformation engine. Let's look at another kind of rule. This, this rule is going to 
uh, replace, we, we've got this ID with theme on it here that is in the original theme. It has children, and I've just said theme one stuff for the children, but that could be a rich set of content that's, that uh, is in the theme right here. And we are going to replace all of the children of theme one with the content we pull from the content management system. So what's different from the previous rule? This rule is going to replace children, not replace everything. So our, when, we, when we run the rule, we actually simply pull in the portion of the, uh, the, portion of the theme that said div id equals theme. That, that whole block is still there, but we've replaced its content. And we've replaced its content with an XSL instruction to pull in, pull in something from the content. Then we run it through the second phase, and in the second phase, the content becomes visible and the actual replacement is made. And the thing for you to notice about the theme children rule is that it only affected the children of our target, the target in the theme. Okay, a little bit more complicated rule because this, now we're going to introduce the idea of conditionals. That a certain kind of work is only going to be done if a condition is met. So this is a replace rule that it would be much like we had before if it wasn't for this if content rule that we're putting into it. Now the XSL that's going to be generated it is in pseudo quote going to look something like XSL if content has something, then it XSL go and pull in the material from content one. And if it doesn't, leave the theme stuff untouched. So when in doubt, the theme stuff is untouched. So now we've ch that content, the condition is worked through by generating a set of XSL that has an if then else on it. If it, if our condition is met, we pull in the content. We execute our rule to grab content or replace. But if it's not, the theme content, the portion of the page in the theme remains unchanged. It passes over to the final product. Okay, let's look at even some more sophisticated rules. In Diezo, we can say, I, I already showed you that we could replace children. We can also say that we want to grab something from the content and put it before a portion of the theme, or after a portion of the theme, or before the theme children, or after the theme children. The after the theme children will, for example, go right above the closing tag that we've identified. So in XSL, we're gonna pull in whatever we want that was in the content before. So here's our before rule. Here, here now we've got the beginning block that came from the theme that we're attaching to, that's our target. Now we're gonna pull in what was meant to go before the children. Now here is the theme one stuff just being untouched, left in there. And I apparently have limited range for this. Now we're going to put in something after the children with some XSL and close the target div and then pull in what it goes afterwards. Okay, now I have written my rules in that order, but order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. I can completely reorder those rules and it's going to produce exactly the same template. The, uh, it is a good idea to order your rules the way I originally did for readability's sake so that you can understand your, your rules. But it has nothing at all to do with what gets generated. If your level of specificity is the same, order doesn't matter. Okay, now, so far we've been talking about the rules that I think you use the most that are taking uh, a target in the theme and blending it in with something from the content. But remember I also mentioned that there were content drop and replace rules where you can grab a portion of the content and make it disappear. 
Content drop and replace rules are extremely useful because they can dramatically simplify your rule set. You can be grabbing a great big chunk of content and instead of having to identify a lot of points inside that content and individually grab them, you can drop and omit things that you don't want to pass over. So those are content drop and replace rules. Now, remember that part two processing that I was talking about? Part one is where the XSL template is being generated. Part two is where the XSL transformation happens. Part two is where those content drops and replaces actually take place. Because remember, the content is invisible in part one. It only becomes visible in part two. So here is, here is a simple replace rule. Oh, I, I now want to show you how it blends with the others. Here is a simple replace rule. It's targeting a portion of the theme, and it's going to be replacing it with content. Now, I told you that, that, I told you that we pull in the content, that that's the result of that. But the fact is, remember that XSL keeps processing until there are no more rules to go. In fact, there is an extra step that XSL generates here, which is to process what got pulled in, and in particular, to at this point do all of the content drops and replaces. So that's the kind of rule set that we get generated when we use content drop and replace commands. It will do something, and then in the course of processing what it already did, it will actually do its content drops and replaces. I'm seeing looks that range from a little bit confused to I know this stuff already. Is anybody very confused at this point? Okay. We'll have more examples. Okay. Let's, let me show you a rule set where we're going to be trying to do something that I'll bet you will want to do or may have already tried to do. Uh, we are going to, we've got a couple of before and after rules, and then we're going to try and, and uh, drop a piece of content, something in the content that we don't want to come across. Here's what that XML, or rather the XSLT, when I was first describing it, that was what it looked like. In fact, though, what is happening is something more like this. So let me just step back. This is how I first described it when I wasn't talking about content drops and replaces. But this is actually closer to what's going on. Our XSL rule will say, OK, you had a before rule that wanted me to grab in some content and put it here. I will do that. And now I will process what I just, oops. Let's see. Well, that's, oh, sorry about that. What, what is happening on my screen is that a, uh, the process that tried to log me into the Wi-Fi just claimed focus. OK, so I'm back again. And let's see, I was saying that it's, it's pulled, pulled in what it's going to pull in, and then it goes on in an extra step. It processes what it just pulled in to do the con any content drops or replaces that it needs to do. Here's the after rule. It's pulling in what it, it processes, but then it's continuing processing to do those content drops and replaces. And once again, the order of your rules basically doesn't matter. We could have reordered those rules entirely. The produced XSLT that, that is going to be used to transform the page, transform the content, uh, was unchanged by my reordering of my rules. Okay, he, at, a moment ago I said I was going to show you something that you really do. That's what I'm going to get to now. Let's apply that knowledge. Uh, let's move some content around. Now remember, uh, actually in the very first example I put you up, I showed you the Plone homepage and said, okay, we've got a news column, we're going to grab our Portland news content and we're going to put it there. So, we, if we're writing this, and we're working with this sort of naive mental model where the order of the rules matter, we might write that this way. Uh, let's say we're also keeping the right column, but we don't want the news to appear in two places. So we are going to replace the, in the theme, the theme children actually, the contents of the news slot that we're grabbing. We're, or, or that is in the theme, and we're going to replace it with Portlet News. So we've grabbed the news portlet, 
and we've moved it to a news slot on our theme page. Then let's drop Portlet News because we don't want it to appear in two places. And let's replace our themes right column with the column three out of the content. So it's as if we had a column three that had uh, various portlets in it. We wanted to grab the news portlet and move it over to a news slot, but we still wanted to have all of those right-hand portlets. Does what I'm trying to do basically make sense? Okay, the, the, and here in our theme, we've got a news slot and we've got a right column. Now, this will not work. Actually, let me back up one. Uh, what will happen in this is that you will have no news at all, the way that this was done. And the reason is that, you were, that I was supposing when I wrote this, and you may have supposed it as you followed me, that that drop rule would be executed between the two replaces. In fact, it is not. The drop rule is being executed each time some content is brought in. So as this is actually going to be processed, the, uh, we're going to go over and try and drag some content over to the news slot, the Portlet News. Then we're going to do the post-processing and that will drop it all. Then we do another replacement and it's already, it's, uh, that also gets followed by the drop rule and we get no, no Portlet News at all. It's been dropped in both places. All the, the, drop con the content drop, the content replace rules are all being applied in the second portion. So how would we fix it? If you've worked with Diazo a lot, you've discovered that the key to fixing it is that you add a mode equals raw directive. And we're adding that to the original replace command and I'll show you that why it's there. So, mode equals raw, you may be wondering. Does that mean that there's a cooked? <laughs> so, Paul, was, was raw and cooked in Diazo originally? No, it came along later on. To... We put it in there, we just didn't give you a choice. Ah. <laughs> you didn't give us a choice between raw and cooked? Or? Okay, uh, Paul is saying that originally they tried to figure this out for themselves, so they didn't give us the power to, to do these little hints to say how, it should, be being, how sh it should be going. When you apply mode raw, what you're actually saying is don't do the post-processing step. Don't do the drops and replaces other than just a little bit of cleanup. So let's take a look at a rule. And, and the simple execution of that rule. We've got a replace rule that re replaces theme children in the theme with content children that we're pulling from the content. The XSL that's generated for that is to pull in column three from the content, then do all content drops and replaces on what was inserted. However, if we instead add mode raw, to that command, then we pull in column three at this point, but then we only do routine cleanup. We will not do any content drops and replaces. There won't be any post-processing other than that to generate nice clean HTML at the end. So did, did Lawrence add this? Paul, do you know? Or did, did, Lawrence, did, did Lawrence add the mode raw? Lawrence Rowe. Lawrence Rowe was the person who made the transition from XDV, the predecessor, to Diazo. Okay, what lessons should you have learned from this? The first is that rule order mostly doesn't matter. Order rules for clarity. When you're writing the rules, order them for clarity. When would rule order matter? Rule order would only really matter if the rules you were writing had equal specificity and were attaching to the same nodes. So they targeted exactly the same point in the theme 
and they had equal specificity in terms of their definition, then the order of your rules would matter. But that's going to be an extremely unusual case. If you're writing rules like that, you're probably not thinking about your problem clearly. So write your rules for clarity. Don't think, though, that the rule order matters. So you're writing them for clear, you're ordering your rules so that you understand them, but not thinking that that translates into the, that they are executed that way. When you have conflicts, when you have problems to solve, solve them with specificity. Use a more specific selector than you would otherwise be using. And basically, that's just like CSS. How do we resolve style rules? I mean, problems with styles we create a more specific rule to re resolve the, the classes. We affect a more particular thing. And if you are using CSS selectors uh, in Diazo, and there's, there is no reason not to, then it will be CSS. I mean, it will be CSS's specificity rules that will be being followed by the translation into XPath uh, that will make your determination about how things are affected. Okay, also remember, I didn't put that out there as a slide, remember that this mode raw may become critical to avoid post-processing. That only matters if you're beginning to do content drops and replaces, but you will do content drops and replaces as your themes become, or as your rule sets and themes become more elaborate. And you will resolve problems of content disappearing by using mode raw to prevent the post-processing when you don't want it. Okay, where does Diazo break down? You can do a lot with Diazo by remembering what I'm talking about, but there's still going to be a frustration point. No matter how specific you make your rules, no matter how much you use your CSS specificity, you will not really be able to manipulate the content beyond, beyond drops and replaces. In particular, at this time, we have very limited ability to manipulate attributes and text in the content. Cla by attributes, I mean class, uh, or pardon me, the uh, attributes of the HTML tags. We, they're very hard to change on the fly as they come from the content. Uh, there are a few rules that we can do it, uh, but, but in general, uh, it, that, it's not very easy. Those things require XSLT. Once you get to that point, you know, once you, once you get to that point where uh, you can't think about how to, to grab hold of anything as it's passing, passing through and Diazo hasn't given you anything other than a content drop and content replace rule, you'll need XSLT. And we're not doing XSLT today. So let me tell you something about exploring Diazo now. And I'm going to be basically showing you the tools that I used to figure out what was going on in Diazo. Uh, if you've worked some with Plone and Diazo, you may have discovered that there is a Diazo sort of debugger that shows you which rules are executing and which rules are not. I, I never found it very useful. It never helped me figure out what was going on. What did help me figure on, out what was going on was actually doing a Diazo compilation, which would compile the theme file into the uh, XSLT file, the theme and the rules file, and looking at it. Now, how can you do that? In build out, in a build out that you're setting up, just declare a part Diazo tools, and then this is all you need to have inside that part. Use Z, 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 C recipe egg and just say eggs equals Diazo. Then, after you run build out and you look in your bin directory, you're going to have a couple of extra commands Diazo compiler and Diazo run. The Diazo compiler will take a rule, rules file and it will output a theme file. You can also specify the, the uh, or not a theme file, it will outlet, output an, a, a theme uh, XSL template. Uh, this would require that the rules file specify the name of the theme file to write it that simply, but you can specify it directly or, or automatically using index.html. Diazo run will allow you to take the XSL that you generated and combine it with content. So you've, you've uh, run build out, you've got these extra tools. Well, you've got your theme page. It's just a basic page. You've got your rules page. You know, write them into files on the file system. Run the Diazo compiler. 
output a, a theme XSL file, ignore most of the XSL, because you have to learn a lot to start under, understanding XSL. I mean, not that you can't learn it, you can learn it, but it, it takes time to, to uh, get the picture of what XSL is doing. But look at how the theme has been generated. Look at where things end up. You will be able to read if-thens in XSL. You'll be able to figure out what's going on. You'll get a great idea of structure. Okay, so that's the basics. The, here's our Plone community from last year that will have, have some time here, a picture of the Plone community now. And you're the people who are using and doing the next generation of the code. So thank you all very much. <clears throat> so.